It's beginning to feel a lot like Christmas. Hello again. We're on to episode 12 of Doctor Who, which is entitled The Edge of Destruction, and um, which, uh, for those who don't know, uh, is a two-episode story, um, which was a sort of stopgap. Uh, Doctor Who was initially commissioned for, if I recall rightly, 13 episodes. And uh, David Whitaker, the script editor, um, or David Whitaker, um, uh, just had to rush this one out in what uh, must be the first of many Doctor Who stories that just had to happen, no matter how they happened. Um, um, now, we're watching this story, uh, both my, me and the good lady Dr Collins um, were excited and pleased that we got off Scaro, as you may have picked up from our last conversation, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, a new jape on Territories New, and what of course we get is a story entirely set within the TARDIS, and one of a very, very small handful of stories where the only, well, episodes... I don't know, but a small handful of moments in Doctor Who where you only have the uh, four, the, the major characters, which obviously becomes increasingly less when there's less major characters. Now, just to give you the potted, um, about a, th a quarter of the way through this episode, uh, I realised that Lib was singing, it's beginning to feel a lot like Christmas, possibly having been distracted by the beautiful tree that uh, the three of us here have created. Um, over the last couple of days. This doesn't all go well. Um, and here's the fundamental problem with the edge of destruction. It's, it's pointless giving you a plot breakdown. Effectively, weirdness happens. That's it. Uh, much weirdness. And um, the weirdest of all is Susan in this story. Uh, and I'll get this out of the way to begin with. I just don't believe Carol Ann Ford uh, in her interpretation of Susan. Now, I can only put this down to uh, a combination of script and actor because there are plenty of moments in the remainder of the ep uh, with the other characters in the episode who also I just don't believe and that's unusual and uh, normally buy into what Ian's doing and Barbara's doing and the Doctor's less of the Doctor because of this enigmatic thing but those two normally you know rock solid but quite deliberately this story sets them up to be um they almost seem anaesthetized at the start and uh and uh, uh don't quite remember what's been going on then they kind of remember then they kind of forget again um there's uh an unknown issue there's clearly a problem but nobody at any point really puts out what the problem was apart from everybody fell over now if every time everybody fell over in the tardis uh, we had a story like this, then we'd only ever have stories like this, quite frankly, because everybody's always falling over. All the times are shaking, we're all falling over. Two episodes of conjugating, uh, conjugating, cogitating. Um, anyway, the problem here is, uh, in a short pithy way, um, it's either very, very clever and on almost like a, a bordering on the sort of not surreal, but. Uh, hyper sort of odd um, uh, play in the way that Doctor Who at this period sometimes feels like a play. You know, we've got a close set, four characters. It's very theatrical in that regard. If it had worked as well as one would hope it would have done, it would be a roaring success and we'd all go, what a fantastic thing, why don't we have stories like this all the time? Set completely within the TARDIS, this made Doctor Who fans very happy. Woohoo! That's my cat outside, if you can hear her. She's a bit annoyed because we have the nursery hamster. And so for obvious reasons, she's not coming in here. Whilst I can't stop her from eating the nursery hamster. This wouldn't go down well at the nursery. Uh, what's also not gone down well at the nursery hamster is the fact that the nursery hamster has bitten my wife. Even though the nursery hamster allegedly doesn't bite people. This is a complete aside. And probably says more about the episode than I could have done with actually saying anything about the episode. Here's the fundamental problem. We don't know what's going on. We we know there's a problem. We're not entirely sure even what it is. The closest we have to an antagonist in this episode is Susan, who goes absolutely bonkers, holds a pair of scissors, starts stabbing the bed, uh, and acting very, very weird. Um, everybody's under suspicion 
uh, it's mooted at one point that perhaps is an, uh, an entity that has taken over control of um, a member of the TARDIS crew. And this is, for, for a show on a Saturday afternoon, a science fiction show, I imagine this is quite high-end ideas. I'm not saying it's high-end science fiction ideas. Obviously, science fiction was whiz bang. But for a tea time show, um, there's loads of ideas thrown out, which, plot spoiler fat fans, aren't going to be what actually is the problem here. But things like, there's somebody in the TARDIS, there's a person in the TARDIS, there's an intelligence in the TARDIS, maybe this intelligence in the TARDIS has taken over one of us, and that's why weirdness is happening. Lots of things going... Now, if this was... Dot two circa 2011, or even, let's be fair, a few years after this episode was aired, we'd find that quite, yeah, 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 yeah I'm getting this, I'm getting this, I'm getting this, what's it actually going to be? And the resolution, as it will uh, eventually end up being, would be very, very satisfying. However, we're on episode 12, you know, and we're still not entirely sure what this show's all about. The show does itself doesn't know what the show's all about. So, this throwing out of interesting ideas amid a, a morass of weirdness that sometimes feels eerie and sinister and peculiar and, and does kind of make you go ooh and other times feels like a badly written six form play now I'm not criticising anybody for that I've written badly written six form plays can I just state I was in six form at the time I'm not saying I come home on a Saturday night and sit in front of my computer and write plays that I then get my friends to come around and put on. They wouldn't be my friends for very long if I did that, and who could blame them? Anyway, so if the major antagonist is, is an unknown figure, and our protagonists that we've just started to get comfortable with are all acting a bit weird, one has to ask, where's the... Where's the drama going to come from? Where's the conflict? Where's the action? What's going to happen here that's going to make this work? And the short answer to that is it doesn't really work. And that's a shame. And it's a shame because perhaps it's just a bit too ambitious. Now, let's be frank, this is a story born of necessity and therefore concepts of ambition uh, is perhaps... Um, a bit unfair to throw at it you know it's too ambitious at this stage well not really it's just doing what it has to do to survive the show as so often happens in Doctor Who is it just does what it has to do to get by let's see um, uh, Heartless Trout let's see uh, Earthbound Stories let's see um, well we could quote unquote quote, quote, and we'll come along to them as we keep, keep going so essentially what we've got here is a story that doesn't work because we're not well in enough with our main characters to really be comfortable with the difference in them as this episode progresses. Um, uh, any sort of like, uh, what's that word, bon, bon homie, bon homie, any bon homie homies, um, is kind of lost within, that we had at the end of the Daleks, is completely lost within seconds because everybody loses their memory for a bit. <laughs> uh, the Doctor sports a Bjorn Borg sweatband throughout the whole of the story, which, if nothing else, adds comic value, but it's never remarked upon. Uh, Bjorn Borg was probably after this anyway, so we can't really blame them for that. Uh, and essentially, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, because Edge of Destruction does have a bit of a place in Doctor Who fans' hearts, it, at least when I was learning about Doctor Who and, and starting to get well versed in all these different stories even though I'd not seen them Edge of Destruction was kind of like oh I'll set in the ties oh weirdness happening oh and it just falls a bit flat it just falls a bit flat and I can't really blame I can't really blame I can blame Susan because I just don't think she's got the chops Hartnell Hartnell's giving a tough ask one minute he's absolutely bawling out the companions another minute is bringing in cups of tea or some sort of drop before bed poor old Ian's just neutered throughout the whole thing just whether it be through like I say amnesia or just through just through not really having anything to do the only person who shines in this and it's only for a minute is Barbara when she gives the doctor what for and that's a brilliant moment that is a really good moment she takes him to task and he's got no response um and that's great. And then at the cliffhanger, we get Hartnell prancing about as if he's the bad guy. And then a pair of hands come into shot. 
um, strangling him. Now, let's be honest, anybody watching this may thought, well, perhaps somebody has got in the TARDIS, but if you take the fact that somebody probably hasn't, it's pretty obvious whose hands they are. So it's not much of a cliffhanger. So I'm a bit, a bit good because I wanted this to be really good. I wanted this to to sing a bit, and zing a bit, but it doesn't. And that's a real shame. I hope the next one's good. The resolution is good because after that we've got some reconstructed episodes. And quite honestly, you know, watching it with the wife kind of justifies it. There's a brilliant blog. I'll do this now because nobody's watching and they don't need the publicity, called uh, Adventures in Travel and Time Space with My Wife, or something like that. If you put Doctor Who and Wife in, you should find it in Google. Uh, where a guy's basically jotting down his wife's reactions to uh, Doctor Who stories. And it's good and it's funny. Uh, and uh, and it's interesting seeing another person's perspective. Well, I get that. I, I get that with Lib. Um, but, you know, she's she's a good girl, my wife. And she sits down and uh, if she's not enjoying it, humours me. And if she does enjoy it, just gets on and enjoys it. But uh, when do we get on something really good? I don't know. I'm looking at my shelf now. Oh, God. Uh, I know what's coming up soon. Right, we best leave it there. So, all in all, you know, come on, Dr. True. Put your finger out. We need, some, we need something kick-ass now because I'm starting to get a bit... So I'll give it ground down by this. I'm not obviously really getting ground down. I'm watching Doctor Who on a very regular basis. I watch it episodically. I watch it like, like, oh, I still love it. It's still fantastic. But it's just a bit annoying because I want these early things to, to kick and zing and to start to... Yeah, there, we go. there we go, such a life. Anyway, good to speak to you. Uh, see you again soon. It's beginning to feel a lot like Christmas.